Welcome to the Christmas Special 2021. I wasn't going to do one of these, but hey, it's the season of goodwill and all that. Christmas was always a time of excitement if you had a Spectrum, or any other computer for that matter. You would hopefully get lots of Spectrum-related presents, or money to buy Spectrum-related things. So, what have we under the tree this year, I wonder? Ooh, this looks good. Excellent. It's a Kempston printer interface. That'll be good to try out. It's a good job I've just got a new ribbon for my printer. Let's try another one then. Ooh, nice paper. And it's a Tasman printer interface. Okay, so I can try them out together and maybe compare them. Great. Next present then. And it's a Romantic Robot Multiprint printer interface. Okay. Right, moving along. Next one. A DK Tronics printer interface. Uh -huh. An L Print 3 printer interface. Ooh. A Daytel box. What could be in here? A Daytel printer interface. Right, I see. Okay. Well, despite the prompting, I'm not going to test all of these out. At least, not in this episode. It's Christmas after all. Let's play some festive games. This is Snowman from Quicksilver, released in 1984. This game is obviously a tying with The Snowman, a film by Raymond Briggs and sang by Ali Jones, if I remember rightly. The idea is that you have to build a snowman, and to do this you wander about collecting bits of snow and drop it in the area on the screen, highlighted by a big pointy arrow. And as you do this, the snowman will be created. You also have to avoid the chasing monsters. And on level 1, these are flames. You also have to keep picking up food to keep yourself awake. And you can also pick up things for extra scores. There's a lot to remember, but in essence, it's a platform game with snow. The flames don't kill you, but if you are carrying snow at the time, they will knock it away and it will appear somewhere else on screen. You also have to be careful not to fall off the platforms. Otherwise you drop into bed and go to sleep and lose a life. The food is very important, so you need to grab it as soon as it appears to keep your food bar high. When you finally build the snowman, you get a rendition of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And the next level begins. Here you have to grab clothes to dress the snowman in. On this level, the ghosts, I think they're ghosts, will kill you if they touch you. So you need to be careful here, which isn't always easy. There are safe areas though at the bottom of the screen if you need them, and you'll spend a lot of time sat in there waiting for the ghosts to go a different way. The graphics are okay I suppose for 1984, and do move smoothly enough, but the sound is a bit minimal, but I suppose it's okay for the game. What lets this game down though is the mechanic. Sometimes it can be tricky to align the player to the platform vertically, especially if there's a ladder above or below you. You find yourself not quite high enough or not quite low enough, which is very annoying. If you complete this level, which is very tricky indeed, you have to collect other things that I couldn't identify. Maybe a tie, is it? And it's at this point though I lost interest. It started to become very frustrating. After the tie you have to collect a pair of glasses, a pair of trousers, a torch, and a skateboard, and finally some balloons. 
and it took me about 30 minutes to complete this level, even with infinite lives. Once you do this, it's back to the flames and collecting ice blocks. Now, the instructions say you have to do this to stop the ice melting, but I think it's just another way of collecting things and dropping them on the snowman, and they couldn't think of anything else that a snowman would need. I mean, why would a snowman need a skateboard? If you can bear it that long, it all starts again, but with a different layout. It's not a bad game, but the platform issue is a real killer. I lost so many lives because the man just wouldn't get on the platform quickly enough. Anyway, on to the next festive game. This one's Collins Crimbo Caper, written by Stone Chap Productions and released in 2016. Now this game uses the Sir Lancelot engine, a game I reviewed last episode. And yes, it has the same mechanic problem as that game. You can move left and right and ascend the ladders, and that's it. The idea is to collect the flashing objects and avoid being killed. The trick to this game, as with Sir Lancelot, is to time the moves and work out the correct path to follow. Something that can be challenging and frustrating at the same time, just like the original. I'm sad to say it suffers from the same frustrations though, and despite my many, many attempts, I just couldn't get past level 1. I nearly did it once, but ran out of time. Oh well, all this is making me grumpy. So let's play Grumpy Santa to see if it will cheer me up. A game released by me in 2017. Here you play Santa, who just wants to get drunk, don't we all? But Mrs Claus has said he can't have a drink until he's collected all the parcels that have been stolen by the evil snowmen. This is a platform game, written using Arcade Games Designer, and I did it as a bit of a challenge, to see if I could write a game in two days. I failed. It took three. As you can see, it's jolly, it's fun, and just the right thing to relax with. No wonky controls here. As you collect each parcel, they appear at the bottom to build a larger parcel, and when all four parts have been collected, it's on to the next screen. You have to watch out for the nasty elves, birds, fire, and bad-tempered hats. Yes, that's hats as in Christmas hats. The graphics are passable, with typical AGD smoothness. The star effect has been used here to mimic snow, which I think looks well. Many people have pointed out that there's no music, but hey, three days, come on. And now on to a new game by Alan Turvey. Let's have a chat with him, shall we? Hi Alan, how are you doing? I'm very good Paul, Merry Christmas to you. And to you, thank you very much. So you've released a Christmas game. I have, yes. And, and it's not just any old Christmas game, it's also linked to a charity. It is, yes, it's linked to uh, Crisis, who help uh, homeless people at Christmas, so it's a, a really good cause. And to be able to contribute you can buy this game 
um, in, on real media, is that right? Uh, yes, that's right. There's a digital and there's a physical copy. Uh, it's all done through Chronosoft, who I know you, you put games out yourself. Uh, you know Simon, he's a really good guy, so he's going to be producing the physical copy. When you buy the physical copy, you also get the digital copy. All yeah. profits go to the charity. So why, why did you start? Why did, why did you decide to do a Christmas game? I mean, I've done one, and it, they're, they're very niche because the people only usually look at them around Christmas anyway. Well, it started off with a little mini game that I did for for Christmas called Snowballers, which was basically just uh, like a back garden with two kids throwing snowballs over a fence, like a two-player competitive game. Yeah. And then I was chatting with Andy Johns about it, and we d- we thought maybe we could expand it, make it into a a bigger game and I had a few bits of code lying around you code for sort of collecting things and and so on so kind of transferred that code over and um, it started to to get a game and then and then we thought well let's get a few others in the community involved so um, and that was in uh, 2018 and then we ran out of time because as you said Christmas games they're only going to be something people are interested in at Christmas and by the time it got to the 22nd, the 23rd of December, we thought we're just not going to do it. We're going to just have to leave it till the next year. So it's been in development for quite a while then. Or the idea <laughs> yeah, has been around years. for quite well, a while. Well, basically, yeah, because then the next year in December, I got married and I was a bit too busy. And then obviously last year, the whole world was kind of up, upended. So, um, but this year, thankfully, uh, we've had a little bit more time. So we started it in the middle of November and had a hectic couple of weeks. Yeah, we managed to do it. So you said it was written in AGD? Yeah, it is, although it's, it uses um, an, an engine which I'm calling AGDX Plus. And AGDX Plus is like a lot of the different patches that I've created over the years all kind of merged into one way. You can pick and choose which ones you want. Um, I added quite a lot of features to this game. So Yeah, there are some things um, I've, I've noticed in there that, were, that are not in the, the stock AGD. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, the thing is with a Christmas game, you really want it to be quite polished, you know. So yeah, one of the things I did was the panels, you know, there's a lot of very big graphics, you know, like the logos and the little, there's an end screen and various things like that. Um, Also, it has the AY music built in. I rewrote the particle engine as well. One of the things I think is really nice about the game that people enjoy is the sort of snow effects. Mm. It's got that kind of manic mine and melting levels, but it, it looks more like snow. I know there was a there was a there was a comment on one of the forums that said um, the the snowball throwing mechanism makes it slightly more tricky because it doesn't throw in a straight line. It's it's an arc and you, you have to go. Well, that's right. Yeah, we we tried uh, we tried it where you just threw it straight and it was just so easy. And and also then you can you can aim at enemies above you. And then there's 25 levels representing the 25 uh-huh. days of Christmas, I presume. That's it. Yeah, we well again, it was another thing that wasn't in the original game book that we, that I came up with uh, just in the last few weeks was to make it like an advent calendar. Mm. We had to come up with 25 different icons related to Christmas. <laughs> and believe me, once you get to 16 or 17, yeah, you you, you know you, you're doing things like bowls of sprouts and you're starting to scrape scrape the barrel a little bit. But uh, people like uh, Jared Bentley and uh, Gabriella Mori. Yeah, and, no Matt Ricardo and John Davis and uh, there's a whole list All, every, everyone's credited in the game anyway so there's a lot of people and I do like the game it's not overly hard is it and I hate Christmas games that are overly hard I think a Christmas game should be nice and e- ease you into the gameplay and have easy easy controls because the last thing you want on Christmas Day is, is frustration absolutely and and to be honest that's another I mean it was a little bit harder but then we thought let's Let's make it easy. Let's make it a kids' game, even. You know, let's. Look. I'd, I'd I'd love it if a few people were able to sort of play it with their kids. You know, on, on Christmas, that's a, a time when you do have a bit of time to sit down and do something like that. So I presume there's not going to be a Christmas game next year, and I presume you'll we'll be working on many other things, including AGD Plus and things. Well, some people have said, oh, you should do it every year, and uh, I don't know, maybe there'll be a snowed under two. We got, we actually got five or six extra levels that uh, that didn't make it because of the 25 limit. So. Um, 
It's possible. We might do a, we, we, we might do something like that next year. Maybe we'll get a new, another 25 levels people can design and bring out a, a, a sort of uh, lost levels version maybe next year. Who knows? Well, thank you, Alan, for sharing your game, and uh, I hope I hope the charity re- really does well out of it. Good, and uh, Merry Christmas to you and all the followers, and a very happy New Year. Lots of things in the pipeline that should be out in uh, January, February. So uh, look forward to perhaps talking to you some more then. Who knows? Well, after that, it's time for a mince pie and some beer, or at least some wine, and a nice read. The magazines were always excellent in the run-up to the festive season, and Crash has some fantastic covers. This just epitomises Christmas, the 1984 Crash Christmas issue, the first one. In 1985, great concept again, as always with Ollie Frey, and the detail is brilliant. Anyone remember getting this? I certainly do. And 1986 again, excellent. Let's take a peek inside the first one then, and see what was happening 37 years ago. Wow, is it really that long? This is my original copy I purchased back then, and it's seen many a good read and many a house move. But that's what magazines are meant for, to be used. There's a piece looking back at 1984, asking if the games still stand up and how things worked out for various companies. Ultimate Play the Game had given us Attic Attack, a new kind of game, something dubbed an arcade adventure. And Crash were expecting more games to follow, but got Imagine's lackluster Alchemist instead. As they say, a lot of hot air. Chucky Egg gets a mention for being, in their words, endearing. I wonder if they ever thought it would become a classic 37 years later. Hmm. DKtronic Speed Duel they didn't like at all, calling it completely unplayable. I don't think it was that bad, to be honest. There was definitely an underwater theme going on. Scuba Dive from Jurel, Aquarius from Bugbite, there was Devils of the Deep from Richard Shepard Software, a truly terrible game that they didn't even waste their time complaining about. There was Glug Glug from CRL, a decent game, but of all those they thought Scuba Dive was the best one. CRL get slammed, not for the first time, for what they called pathetic games, Caveman and Lunar Lander, and I fully agree with them. Caveman is a sort of messed up frogger, and Lunar Lander is a basic Lunar Lander clone. Other companies to get mentions included Arctic for Bear Bother, Jurel again for Combat Links, and Houston Consultants for 3D Lunar Attack. There's an interesting comment about Jet Set Willy here. Crash were given a preview version and used screenshots from it. However, these then did not appear in the game. This called for some complaints from readers, saying that they didn't actually see the game at all. Jet Set Willy, though, was probably the biggest game of the year, despite the attic bug. That was, of course, until Saber Wolf was released, at a higher price point, though, which caused some discussions. Imagine, say the magazine, continued down the slippery slope with Cosmic Cruiser, and several companies get some harsh words about their olympic themed releases, with Ocean winning out with their ever-present Daily Thompson's Decathlon. CRL get more bad press again with the release of Terror Hawks and the truly awful War of the Worlds. And I think the biggest missed opportunity here was Deus Ex Machina from Automata. It gets a brief mention for what was a game well before its time. Game reviews then, and the first Crash Smash was Night Law, which gets a big thumbs up scoring 94%. The comments say it all, really. Very impressive graphics, fingers itching to play it. It's nice, they say, that Ultimate have departed from the Saberman theme. But hang on, this is a Saberman game, unless they meant the usual 2D Saberman game. However, 
On the same page, Underworld, a 2D Saber Man game, is also a Crash Smash. Not really sure what's happening there. Now, Underworld for me is not a good Ultimate game. If any other company had released it, I would have said it's great. But because it's Ultimate, I was expecting more, and I wasn't really impressed with it. Maybe because I could never play it, and it was just too annoying. Anyway, Crash gave it 92%. 92% Astronaut from Software Projects gets a fair review, scoring 81%. I like this game. And it's by the same author as Thruster, another nice game, and it provides something different. Now here is a game that I never played, and I never understood the excitement about, Load Runner. Maybe I'm missing something, because I know it has a large following across all platforms, but uh, I suppose I'm going to have to play it now, aren't I? Okay, the game of the game is to collect the gold ingots from each level and escape. You can climb ladders, cross ropes and dig holes, a bit like Space Panic the arcade game and the numerous other Panic variants for the Spectrum. The chasing enemies though, when they drop into the hole, don't die, unless of course the wall fills in first. You can fall from any height which is a good thing, and the graphics, although small, work well and provide a nice look and feel. Sound on the 1 to 8 machines is good with a nice tune, although some 128k files I tried didn't have the music. Control is easy to master, which is a good thing, and the game begins in a nice easy way. However, the second level, well, I just couldn't complete it at first. I watched the RZX playback and could see how you got the ingot in the room, but no matter how I tried, I just kept getting killed. Eventually though, I managed it, but it was a real pain to do. Now I'm not sure why there was a big fuss about this game. Yes, it has lots of levels, 150 to be exact, spanning two separate loads, but it isn't anything special. It's a nice playable platform game. The gameplay is good, and you do want to get that little bit further each time you try, but to be honest, it's not a game that I'd come back to. And that's my review. Now the Spectrum in its early days was known for its weird games and game ideas. So Potty Pigeon, or to give it its full title, Percy the Potty Pigeon, fits right into this. Scoring 70%, the game is quite simple in concept. You have to fly about, pick up worms and fly back to the nest to feed your chicks. Let's have a go then. Well, yes, it's a strange concept, but then again, there were many such games for the Spectrum. The graphics are basic, but do the job, and this game really reminds me of Bug Bites, Birds and the Bees. The action, if you want to call it that, is split across multiple screens, and as you fly around, avoiding the other things like birds, spiders and helicopters, you use your energy. You can replenish this by just landing and waiting about for a bit. Yes, it's a very odd game, and I'm not even sure why Percy is potty. He's just doing what comes naturally and feeding his chicks. And to be honest, I don't think this game merits 70%. Anyway, moving on. Mmm, nice keyboard. There is an article covering the disaster that was Imagine Software, and many people have done videos on this subject, including myself. There's also an excellent documentary on YouTube called Commercial Breaks if you're interested, so I won't bother going into this article too much. Skipping on then, more reviews, Boulder Dash, another game I could never get excited about. The concept is good, the game is fine, it's just, well, not really what I enjoy. 
This, however, is Cyclone from Vortex Software. This is a fantastic game. Scoring a measly 79%, the graphics are excellent, and the game is original and well written. It's just brilliant to play. Much better, in my opinion, than Underworld. Pole position scores 68%. Not surprised, really. Enough said. Now I'm not going to read each page and each review out. We would be here for hours, so please forgive me for skipping ahead. Past the Jetman cartoon, and past Microgen's Christmas advert, where they advertise games that aren't really Christmas related. Let's stop at the Crash Readers Awards then for 1984. Best platform game goes to Wanted Monty Mole. Best maze game to Sabre Wolf. And best shoot 'em up to Ad Astra. A nice game that, glad it gets a mention. Best overall arcade game is Daily Thompson's Decathlon, and best text and graphics adventure goes to Lords of Midnight. Jeff will be pleased. Best simulation is Fighter Pilot. Best strategy is Muggsy. And best war game is Stonkers, a game they called out as always crashing in their 84 look back. How odd. And the State of the Art award went to Lords of Midnight. Are you still here? Good. Best text adventure was Snowball from level 9 and the best utility was the quill. And the bummer of the year, stop sniggering at the back, was Cosmic Pirate from Elephant Software. The best joystick interface was the ComCom, and the best advert went to Sabre Wolf. Moving on, and there's a preview of Airwolf, an almost impossibly hard game. There are a few screenshots, but none of them contain an image of the helicopter. How strange. There's the usual plain tips and poked corner, a thing that gradually grew over the Spectrum's life. Imagine not being able to cheat in a game. Imagine having to struggle, to learn the game, to map it and to keep trying and trying until you got a little bit further. Nah, let's just bung in a poke and then complain about how short the game is. Inside Crash is a nice feature about how the magazine is put together. It covers writing, reviews, photography, typesetting, and everything that goes into getting the best-selling Spectrum magazine onto the shelves each month. It must have been hectic, but then again, they got all the new games and had to play them. This photograph interests me. It shows how they take screen pictures. They use a Nid Valley slow-mo device to freeze the screen and then take a photograph of it. How things have changed. We're nearly at the end now, and nearly finished my drink. We get coverage of the 14th ZX Microfair, at the Alexandra Palace in London on the 17th and 18th of November. I wish I could have gone to one of those. They look fantastic. And now we move on to the news, which is oddly at the back of the magazine. And there's the usual silly bit of news. A dispute between software companies about which game is best. Is it Cocker Tony Wolf, Jet Set Willy or Pajama Rama? The kids' classic TV programme Magic Roundabout is to be turned into a computer game. But don't get too excited. CRL are doing the work. And we know how well that went. Strangely enough, later on in the magazine, it's reviewed. So, it's coming soon, but it's also here. They gave it 51%, which I think is far, far too high for that game. AGF, the manufacturers of joystick interfaces, are recalling some of their Protocol 4s. Apparently, they are sub-specification pre-production models that have managed to slip out into the public. You can see if yours is part of a bad batch by entering a small program. I've skipped all the game adverts, along with some content to save time, and picked out things that are interesting to me. This issue would have been purchased pre-Christmas, and you'd have read every page and made notes on the games that you wanted to buy with any money you got. It was a brilliant time, and it's great to read it again, just as the festive season is with us. Looking back, what games still stand up then? Well, certainly Night Law. It was astonishing for the time. And also Cyclone stands out for me, a fantastic game that's always in my top 10. But the winner here has to be Crash Magazine itself. What a brilliant cover, and some great content. It brings back so many memories of Christmas past. 
But what about the Spectrum's very first Christmas, 1982? In the news, the strike at the Timex plant ended in early November, but the loss of production meant possible shortages of the ZX81 and Spectrum for Christmas. This was a massive blow to Sinclair, that hoped their existing stocks would last, but it didn't, and they needed to start production again soon. The demand for Sinclair's new machine rocketed, and a new production plant was set up in Felham, with Thorn EMI assembling the units to try and keep up. Sinclair warned that had the strike continued, they would have had to review the contract with Timex and look at getting another company in to take over. Bad news for Spectrum fans though, hoping to get their machines under the Christmas tree. The Northern Computer Fair was held in Manchester on November the 25th to the 27th, with the star game at the time being Quicksilver's Timegate. Other companies at the show included Arctic, Bugbyte and ANF. A new add-on was released for the ZX81 and Spectrum, the Chatterbox from William Stewart Systems. This is probably the first speech synthesizer for the Spectrum. This little box will allow your computer to talk and be programmed to say absolutely anything. A collection of computer companies are trying to lobby the government to reduce the imports of foreign computers and parts, mainly from the US and Japan. They want a 12-month embargo to allow the UK market to establish itself. Sinclair, however, although being in the group, is not convinced it's a good idea. Sinclair proposed several changes, including procurement policies that ensure equal opportunities for the UK, a reduction on import duty of electronic components, and a push to remove hidden export controls. A lot of Sinclair's products are exported, and they don't want the risk of affecting their sales. In the UK, the Spectrum will now be available in the High Street, something unusual at the time, WH Smith will start selling Sinclair's micros as soon as they can get stocks, which has always been a bit of a problem. The Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, warned UK companies that they had to adopt IT quickly to be able to compete with the overseas organisations that are ahead of us. She held up Sinclair as a shining example, saying their outstanding success should be a lesson of how things should be done. A new kind of programme is starting to appear on spectrums up and down the country, the competition. Several companies have released programmes that give away a prize for the first person to complete them. Automata have Pymania, the winner has to be in a location on a certain day of the year, and the clues are held within the game. The winner gets a golden sundial. And the other company, Arctic Computing, released Crack It with a prize of £10,000. And finally, Sinclair confirmed the ZX Microdrive will be delayed until 1983. Initially planned for late 82, there's been many delays and they have been held to account by the Advertising Standards Authority for claiming a delivery of 28 days, a time that they consistently miss. Well, that's about it for another year. Enjoy yourself over the holidays and thanks for watching the shows.